Um, so the next session is, uh, it's a climate primer. Um, and so um, Chris Field will be giving us a primer on what is the climate science everyone um, should understand and how those economics inform climate projections. Uh, I'm gonna do a very, I think everyone has um, all of their, everyone's bios. So just a quick introduction. Um, of Chris, who is the Perry L. McCarthy Director of the Stanford Wood Institute for Environmental. He's also a Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies. He has worked extensively on climate change, uh, especially uh, looking at solutions to improve li lives now, uh, decreasing the amount of future warming and supporting vibrant economics, um, vibrant economies. Um, he was a uh, co-chair of uh, working group two of the Intergovernmental Panel Chan um, the IPCC between 2008 and 2015. Um, so he's been involved in um, the climate modeling um, community for a while. And so Chris, I think I'm gonna leave it uh, with that and you can um, further introduce yourself if you think I missed something. Uh, and I think we have, let me confirm, you have about eight minutes and then we'll do um, questions again. Thanks very much, Paulina. And if you guys wanna bring my slides up, that'd be terrific. I also just wanna say how much I've enjoyed and learned from the presentations so far. I, I think the um, similarities and differences in the worldview between the climate science community and the economics community are, are incredibly important, but they overlap extensively, especially in the broad area of risk. The message that I wanna start with and really finish with is that the current state of climate science provides a platform for macroeconomic analysis that's, that's robust, but also really, really limited. And it's important to recognize the robustness in terms of our ability to understand and project long-term trends in global temperature. And it's important to recognize the limits to our ability to understand and predict extremes, regional patterns, and to make detailed forecasts on uh, spatial and, and temporal scales that are, that are longer than a, than a few weeks with the kind of detail that makes a difference for for example, emergency responses. Maybe the best way to uh, characterize the current state of climate science understanding. Next slide, please. Do, do I have control? Okay, thank you. Um, is this summary statement from the IPCC sixth assessment? It's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred. And of course, the impacts of those have been extensively documented. And I wanna call out the really important work from Saul Shang and Tim Lenton. And in terms of uh, adding a really thick and important layer of empirical confirmation. Next slide. I, re I really wanna speak to two issues in advance, please. And one more, um, it, to emphasize the kind of sweep of time and the way it's influenced our, our understanding of where we're headed in terms of climate. And I wanna swing back and, and close with a couple of comments that, um, that Adele already really opened up and it's the uh, important appreciation that uh, carbon dioxide is a, a cumulative pollutant and the changes in climate are dependent on cumulative emissions since the beginning of the industrial revolution. And even when we bring net emissions down to zero, we're still left with the total amount of warming that we had at the peak. Next slide, please. And, and to start, I'll, I'll go to this, um, opening figure from a paper that was published in Science a week before last by uh, Supran and others that, that uh, characterizes what was known about climate change 
inside Exxon Corporation and inside the scientific community in the um, uh, 80s and 80s. The, the left-hand panel here is, is projected temperature trend on the lower line, and the red line is the actual temperature trend. Uh, a higher one is the CO2 trajectory that's projected, and, and the blue line is the uh, actual CO2 trajectory. And the upper the upper right panel shows the projected temperature trends from Exxon and, and peer open literature publications, all of which were really good. And the lower shows an amazing 1977 reconstruction of the um, long-term temperature change based on what we knew about the climate forcing from CO2. Next slide. And to put this in a slightly crisper context, here are the temperature projections from the IPCC first assessment report, 1990, and the third assessment report showing a hindcast and forecast uh, part of the plot for the most likely evolution of temperature. And what you can see is that the projection, the thick black line really runs almost exactly through the center of the observations, the, the, the squiggly colored lines. And that even in 1990, 35 years ago, our ability to project not only the, the temperature response to CO2, but to have a reasonable idea of where we're headed in terms of CO2 emissions was pretty solid. And it's striking how good these estimates are. Um, next slide. And as a consequence, we have really good understanding of the relationship between future emissions and um, uh, uh, future temperatures. And, and we have what I would call an evolving understanding of the relationship between the, the temperatures and the, and the impacts. And I think that's where the excitement in the future is gonna be, the scientific excitement and, and where the overlap with this roundtable's work becomes so compelling. Um, back in the IPCC third assessment report in 2000, working group two proposed a, a bucketing of impacts into, into five reasons for concern, one related to you. It's for large scale singular events. I think that uh, use of these five categories is a, is a way to provide a reference point for how we're thinking about the risks of climate change is, has been incredibly valuable and with a value that has really increased over time. And I think it's an important reference point as we think through you know, what's in and what's not in our, our current impact assessments. The, um, in, the, in the IPCC framing, the uh, risks went from not detected to, to very high. I, I, I think as our understanding of the implication of these risks has, has evolved, the, the way I think about it is that the yellow category, moderate risk, means we're, we're pretty sure that we can adapt. The, the red, the high category, means that there are real questions about the effectiveness of adaptation, even transformational adaptation. And the very high, the purple category is one where we're pretty sure we can't adapt, certainly not at the global scale, even if uh, some aspects of society continue on. And it provides a really useful way for asking where the risks come into the most focus, uh, where they're the most intense, and where we have more work to do. The next slide presents an overview of the way our, our understanding of these risks has changed through time, going all the way from 2001 to 2022 for each of the, uh, each of the five reasons for concern. And the striking feature of these is that if you look across the, um, the 2C line, uh, what you see is that in 2001, in general, we considered the the risks at 2C to be in the moderate category, really sure we could adapt, and that the evolution of our understanding since then has, <coughs> we're profoundly wrong about the magnitude of the risk at 2C and even at 1.5C. And uh, 
what you can see uh, for unique and threatened systems, things like rare and endangered species, heritage sites, uh, culturally important sites, that it's clear that there's a transition from the um, red high risk to purple adaptation doesn't it longer work uh, in, in the region of 2C. We also see quite a profound drop in the, um, in the level of alarm or an increase in the level of alarm, a, a drop in the temperature at which the risk transition for the uh, large scale discontinuities that Tim Linton has worked so much on. And we were discussing earlier with the consequences of um, altered ocean circulation for climate in Europe. And this, this transition from thinking that uh, 2C was mostly okay in the, in the early years of the century to recognizing the profound risks at, at 2C really is the accomplishment of climate and impact science over the last 20 years. Next slide. We wrapping up, please. Uh-huh. And the, the, the point I want to close with is really this point about the, um, the linear relationship between cumulative emissions and the total amount of warming that occurs and then persists for hundreds or thousands of years. And if you just uh, advance one, you can see uh, how close we are to the level of 1.5. If we account for uh, double counting and if we account for ecosystem feedbacks, we're within a handful, probably three to five years of a commitment to a warming of more than 1.5 and a commitment to the really unacceptable risks that we see in the, um, in the reasons for concern. So the motivation for uh, bringing together the climate science and the macroeconomics incredibly strong and uh, the opportunities for um, mutual benefit from the two communities are incredibly strong. Look forward to comments and questions. So we're gonna do um, some questions and you can um, raise your hand. Um, I will. Okay. Um, Bob? Sure, I'll just give you an open-ended uh, question, Chris. Uh, having sat through the last uh, five economist speakers, what, what do you think that are sort of, where, where do you think that the, the frontier of climate science is that relevant for the sort of economic projections we're talking about, uh, but not as robust to say the, um, you know, the, the temperature projections and the existence of the carbon budget. Yeah. Like do, where, where do we need more, where do we need more climate science or do we basically have enough climate science to get on with the macro econ? Um, yes and yes, we, we need more and we have enough. The, um, the big areas of progress in the last 20 years have been attribution, especially single event attribution, and a better characterization of the risks of extremes. But it's also clear that we're not at the stage where we're going to be providing accurate seasonal or interannual forecasts of, of individual extreme events and where the kinds of risk management tools that people have been discussing are going to need to continue to be the foundation of the modeling. Rachel. Chris, thank you so much for that bracing um, uh, characterization of the latest science. Uh, you know, sitting through that, what comes through clearly is we're at a little over a degree Celsius and we're already seeing very profound impacts uh, around us already or that have been unleashed whose uh, full impact we will see in the decades to come. And yet, uh, when you look at the policy side, the macroeconomic side, the signal is not detectable. 
So there is clearly something happening here, a disjoint uh, aspect to what the science is increasingly signaling in terms of urgency, running out of time, and an approach uh, that largely, from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, is humming along in a business as usual, um, you know, incrementalist kind of approach. And Hence your point that this couldn't be more timely for a group like this to get together and connect some of those dots. But from your perspective, sitting on the outside, uh, what do you think is driving some of that mismatch? Is it model specifically, or is it uh, different uh, rooms in which uh, these conversations are happening where the, the power structures are different? Uh, the the political calculus is different and what feels pressing in one room and another room, there are other things like the interests of the fossil fuel industry uh, that you pointed out from that Supran et al. paper become uh, the dominant factor driving policy outcomes. It's a really good question and I don't pretend to know the answer. I, I think that one of the most uh, compelling products of a group like this round table would be further thoughts on um, why we're not seeing more of the of the evidence. I, I think that the two things that that I would speak to are that um, you know even though climate impacts are accumulating in a, in a, a compelling and discouraging way, that um, they're occurring in the context of an, of an economy that has all of the um, growth driving factors that that it's always had and are continuing to operate and that the undetectability of the climate effects so far uh, probably has some combination of temporal and, and baseline effects as people have been discussing. I also think that you know, most of the impacts that we're seeing are in, in extremes are, are still relatively limited in um, time and space. And as the number of those impacts increase, I think we'll, we'll begin to see them scale in, in a way that, you know, probably won't be linear. And a lot of the future work that I'm looking forward to seeing is it going to address this question of of how um, responses to extremes interact. Eric, thank you. Yes, I guess I was thinking along similar lines to Rachel, but uh, I'm going to say something which might turn out to be a comment, but I'm going to try to make a, a question. Um, so. Um, we have to act rapidly. I, I, I've, I've seen evidence of the sort that you've presented. Um, and so this is the tension that I hold inside myself. We have to act extraordinarily rapidly. Um, I, I do want to point out that there is a, a oh, I'll start my video, that there is a, a branch of economics, um, actually development economics that uh, has re recommended rapid transformation of economies, and there is some evidence about how to deal with structural change, rapid structural change. Much harder in a in a complex uh, uh, economy like like our own, but it's um it's there, and it's not that there's nothing at all, but um, but this this is the challenge, and this is why it's a comment. This is the challenge for us. Those those of us who are economists have to get away from backing off from rapid change, mm -hmm. um, because there's no option. There there you can you can debate the policy, but the physics is never going to debate with you. So that's uh, just my comment. But if you've got Chris, if you've got words of wisdom to add to that, I'd love to hear. Them. Yeah, thank you for the comment, Eric. Brad. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Chris. My question has to do with climate intervention, uh, both in the impact of climate likelihood and impact of climate intervention in what you presented here, but then the extension of climate intervention into 
incorporating it into the macroeconomic models and how we might try to do that. Yeah, um, we know that the climate effects of carbon dioxide are essentially permanent, at least on a millennial time scale. And what that means is that there, there are two ways we could produce cooling if we decided we wanted to go that route. One is uh, removing the greenhouse gases actively from the atmosphere, CDR, and the other is um, preventing as much sunlight as currently enters the Earth system from entering, reflecting more. Uh, that would be solar geoengineering. And the uh, CDR, remove, CDR is an increasingly important part of the mitigation portfolio. S strong incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. And it looks to me like it will continue to build out as, um, as a complement of all the other mitigation activities that are occurring. The solar geoengineering um, appears based on relatively limited evidence to be technically capable of decreasing the temperature, but not of affecting all of the consequences of climate change, including the acidification of the oceans. And at this point, I think there's a very strong argument for learning more about solar geoengineering to see whether it might bring um, useful levels of, of temperature reduction in a context that were governable and were fair and were technically manageable. But at this point, we're not there. And uh, short of saying that there are answerable questions that need to be answered before we can decide whether solar geoengineering should be a part of the portfolio, it's hard to go beyond that. So I don't see any more questions and I think we're on break time now. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone and we'll reconvene at the top of the hour at 3 p.m. Eastern. With these next 